nice to meet you. Uh, I'm officially James Hazelwood and that's my Alassian account display name. But most of the time I go by Jimmy because that's what most people call me and there are a lot of Jameses out there. Naming things as hard as they say. Anyway, I'm an Alassian developer of nearly 10 years now. And for the last couple of years, I've been working in the space where Connect and Forge meet. Today, I'd like to touch base and have a candid discussion on our latest progress, plans and thinking around Connect and Forge, since Joe Clark and I spoke to you this time last year. Of course, the standard disclaimers apply. I'm not making binding announcements or promises, just giving you a snapshot. Here are the what, where, who, why, and how I'm aiming to address today. So before we move on, I'd better establish the why. Why move to Forge, either now or in the future? Let's revisit the rationale as we presented them at last year's Developer Day. Firstly, build faster with our functions as a service platform. I can appreciate this may be less com compelling for app vendors with well-established Connect apps. You've already learned the ins and outs of running a Connect app. You've written the boilerplate and quite possibly abstracted out some common infrastructure for yourself to reduce the overhead of spinning up a new app. Nevertheless, if you're investing a new feature or a whole new app, Forge can get you there faster. Secondly, how about reduce costs? Let Atlassian take care of the infrastructure. We announced last year that Forge will be free through 2023 at least, which means you'll be spared the expense and effort of hosting and operating front-end bundles, or request handling, async processing and storage, while you get your Forge app up and running. And no doubt you're keen to hear what happens after 2023. I don't have any update for you there, but we know that's a topic of interest. Thirdly, build on Atlassian, powerful new cloud extension points. This presents a tricky trade-off for those of us working on the platform. Of course, we want to make Forge a compelling proposition by offering extension points and features that you can't find anywhere else. But we do also need to invest in parity with Connect, lest the feature gaps drive developers back to Connect. We can be sure that the balance will shift over time, though, as we fill in the blanks and turn our focus to building more exciting Forge early features. We've offered a little taste of that in Jira with the Issue Adjustments API and Automation Actions. Finally, meet enterprise needs without sacrificing your roadmap. I think there's an argument to be made that this is actually the big one. Some enterprise features of Forge are in place, such as SOC 2 compliance. Others like data residency and support for other compliance schemes are still works in progress, but they're on the way. Specific enterprise features aside, there's little disputing the fundamental trust and security proposition of going fully Forge customer data storage and processing that never leaves the Atlassian cloud. Do your customers really care? Well, a lot of our big customers certainly care. In particular, enterprises looking to move from server to cloud will pay close attention to the security posture of cloud apps. If your app can meet their high bar, one way or another, they might become a big customer of yours too. What's more, for the foreseeable future, data, security and privacy awareness and regulations are only going to increase. Some of our research suggests that as awareness grows, lots more of our cloud customers will start paying much closer attention to the relationship between their data and their apps. We'll unpack that a little more later on. Uh, and I said this would be a candid discussion, so what's in it for us? Uh, are we chasing after the novelty of a new Greenfields platform for its own sake? Uh, no, that's not what's going on. It's about reaching the ever increasing bar of customer expectations about their data security, privacy, and trust, and lowering the bar for developers of all sorts who want to build on the Atlassian platform for the mutual benefit of themselves, Atlassian, and Atlassian's end users. And let's not forget that there is more to Atlassian than Jira and Confluence. The vision is for one development platform designed to revolutionize how all Atlassian cloud products are customized, extended, and integrated. Now, yes, if we can get there, it will make the lives of us Atlassian platform engineers easier too. It will mean one modern cloud native platform for us to operate and develop. Uh, but even this will be a mutual win because the time and energy saved can be redirected to fund further features and enhancements. It also means an end to some of the long-standing paper cuts to the legacy parts of the Connect platform. To give just one example, Connect app and installation data lives in individual Jira and Confluence databases as opposed to forge a centralized system of record, which makes it hard to get quick and accurate answers to questions like, 
what versions of this app are installed on what sites. It also slows down the rate at which updates can be rolled out. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Where are we up to today? Time to get our bearings. So in November of 2020, we took our first step, announcing alpha support for putting Connect modules into Forge apps via a special Connect modules field. Then in May of last year, at Dev Day, Joe and I gave a talk entitled Connect and Forge Together, one platform for cloud app development. To share in the words of the abstract, how we're building pathways from Connect to Forge to aid our transition to a single platform. We stayed pretty heads down until September when we shared an update in the form of a blog post. This blog post introduced the paradigm of the four states of Forge adoption. In doing so, it also signaled our intent to someday deprecate Connect iframes and JOT-based API authentication, which led to some robust discussion on the developer community site. Uh, more on that later as well. In November, we released support for moving a marketplace app listing over from Connect to Forge, preserving installations and other metadata in the process. On the 18th of that very same month, we had our first real-world usage of this feature. Two production Connect apps on the marketplace had Forge successes uploaded on the same day. Then, in January of this year, better late than never, we shipped a feature enabling Forge apps, including those migrated from Connect, to access resources not visible to all members of a site in order to match the behavior of Connect. Now those four states I just mentioned is still our main frame of reference for talking about Connect adoption, so it's worth taking a moment to revisit. State zero means plain old Connect, same as it ever was. State one describes four apps that use the backwards compatible Connect modules, the ones that live in the dedicated Connect modules section of the Forge manifest. An app in state one might have a mix of Connect modules and Forge modules, but as long as it still has a Connect module, it's still considered in state one. Now state two apps might still do data storage and processing on remote servers, but no longer use Connect iframes or JOT-based API authentication. We want all apps to get at least this far eventually, uh, when the time is right, when it's possible, for a number of reasons. Firstly, where Connect apps send their data and why is fairly opaque. Forge as a rule requires apps to be more explicit and upfront. Um, especially at least for that first hop. Secondly, we've seen many instances of security issues related to direct learning of iframes from the app server, issues that are uh, sidestepped with custom UI and UI kit. Thirdly, the scopes for JOT-based API authentication are less granular than those we offer for OAuth 2. We could introduce more granular JOT auth scopes, but OAuth 2 has another advantage in that it's an industry standard. OAuth 2 also requires an exchange of credentials for an access token rather than the client minting an access token directly. This allows for enhanced visibility and control in the event of a suspected breach. Now we understand that moving to state 2 is not a small ask for many apps. And indeed, uh, it's barely even possible for most apps as of today. We're working on achieving parity before any kind of deprecation. We're not trying to pull the rug out from under you. Now, state three apps differ from state two only in that they store all their data on Atlassian, whether that's in issue properties or Forge storage. Finally comes state four. State four apps are fully on Forge with all processing and storage of data hosted by Atlassian. State zero is of course still around and will be for quite a while yet. State one has all the basics implemented, but we've still got a bunch of limitations and issues to work through. State two and three aren't available yet, they'll require some additional platform features to be built and shipped. However, given Forge is genuinely available, and so are marketplace migrations, if you can rewrite your Connect app as a Forge app, you can move to state four right away. And indeed, some Connect apps have already moved. Who has migrated, you may ask? Four apps have made the voyage so far. Easy find and replace, site statistics, expression tester, and who's looking. You can find write-ups for the last two on our developer blog. Suffice to say, for certain apps, it can be done. Moving right along to how it works then. At last year's talk, you would have seen something a little bit like this. You can either register your Connect app as is with Connect on Forge, or you can jump straight to a Forge rewrite. We're now gonna dig into each of those options. Let's first examine the register adopt approach. Consider this app with a key of my app. Like all Connect apps, it has a descriptor. It's a non-trivial app with some logic and storage of its own. My app is listed on the marketplace, 
and installed on some sites. The app developer now registers the app on Forge. What is meant by this is they create a Forge app using the CLI tool, copy the modules, key, and scopes from their descriptor into the app manifest, adding prefixes and other format tweaks as needed, then run the deploy command so that the manifest changes are picked up. The app is probably now at version two due to this changed scopes. At this point, the app owner can install the app via the Forge CLI tool for testing purposes, but Marketplace still shows the latest Connect version. Next, the app owner goes to Marketplace and selects the option to upload a new version, but selects the Forge app as the new version. After it's approved by Marketplace support, version two will now show up as the latest version and as an available upgrade to existing install sites. Now it is possible to raise a marketplace support ticket with us to request a more gradual rollout, by the way. At some point, the administrator of bar.atlassian.net upgrades to version two. This triggers a chain of calls in our backend where Forge records an installation against bar.atlassian.net. bar.atlassian.net updates installation data to reflect the new Forge version of the app. Some time passes. The development team rewrite the whole app to fully adopt Forge. They re-release the new all Forge edition of the app, version three. So you can see there is the rewritten app manifest. Now the app logic and storage are now hosted on Forge two. The new version is the on marketplace. The switched on admin of bar.atlassian.net approves this upgrade too, and another chain of calls ensues. The connect data is cleared away, and from this point onwards, bar.atlassian.net gets all its information about my app from Forge, just like any other Forge app. Sometime later, foo.atlassian.net also upgrades, and it didn't see the v2 upgrade, so it jumps straight onto version 3. Now that everything lives on Forge, the Connect app can safely be taken down. Rewriting is actually just the same thing, but with the steps in the middle cut out. Again, we start with my app. Development team then jumps straight to a full rewrite, logic, storage, and all, and updates the marketplace listing with the Forge version. And again, the site admins accept the upgrade, moving the installation from Connect to Forge. In due course, the Connect app server can then be decommissioned. Assuming feature parity gaps, quotas, and other constraints of Forge don't prevent you from rewriting your app, you can take the rewrite journey today. States one, two, and three still have some work remaining to be done. That all leads quite neatly to the next question, what are we doing next? In short, we're working on state one, two, and three, as well as addressing Connect and Forge feature parity. Let's start with what we're doing as far as the states are concerned. So state one, if you can't remember what state one is about, just think backwards compatibility. Parts of state one are usable and in use today. You can port your connect base URL, key, modules and scopes into a Forge app manifest and have these features sync to install sites and surfaced and respected there. What can't you do? Note some parts of the descriptor are made conspicuous by their absence. The actor's user impersonation scope isn't available. Neither are internationalization, data residency, or dynamic modules. Dynamic modules don't show up in the descriptor, but you get the idea. The other missing piece is module updates. Remember that connect models on Forge still get synced to the site at install time. This works today for installations requiring admin approval because those kick off the full installation workflow, including the sync. Getting a bit technical here, but Forge minor version updates are much more lightweight in place operation that don't allow for fanning the change out to all the existing module sites. So if you add some modules but no scopes, you'll get version 2.1 from the point of view of the Forge systems, but the sites where the app is already installed will be stuck on version 2 without even an indication that a newer version exists. Now, if this is something we can address, just haven't addressed it yet. So that's what's coming up for state one. On to state two and three. 
State two means processing and storage of data outside of Atlassian. State three means only processing happens outside of Atlassian. In either case, the main difference with state one is that in place of job-based REST API auth and connect iframes loaded direct from the app server, we have OAuth2 and custom UI for reasons I spoke about earlier. To make state two viable, we need to add some more plumbing. OAuth2 will replace JOT auth for API access, as we've said. Now, many app developers will want their front end to talk directly to the app server, like the connect iframe does. There'll also sometimes be a need for forge functions to call out to the app server and for app servers to kick off forge functions. All three of these are possible today via forge egress permissions for requests inbound to the app and via web triggers for requests inbound to forge functions. But there's no inbuilt authentication available yet. Lastly, to get to state three, we'll most likely need to provide direct API access to storage rather than requiring all data access go via a forge function. So we've got plenty to be getting on with. We can't give you a firm timeline or a fixed sequence, but these are likely to mostly take two to three months apiece. And in the current sequencing, um, the arrangement is something like this. <clears throat> Moving along then to the other part of the equation, feature parity. Even with all the projects done, if your app needs custom content or reports or blueprints or workflow post functions or inline macros, your app won't be able to get beyond state one, right? And some apps are gonna need a relational data store in order to make it as far as state three. In short, be reassured that we're aware of this circumstance and are working on keeping abreast of the gaps and filling them in so that a viable migration path is unblocked for more and more apps as we go. As I said earlier, we're working on achieving parity before any kind of deprecation. We're not trying to pull the rug out from under you. How are we keeping abreast of the gaps? Well, you might have seen this page on developer.lassing.com, connect module equivalents. You might also have seen the Forge public feedback project for tracking Forge feature requests. Although this covers more than just connect module equivalents that still need to be implemented. And what I'll show you next is something you probably haven't seen because it's still an Atlassian internal tool for now. It's a comprehensive database of connect to forge migration blockers and the apps that they block. And we call that Habitat. Here's one screen it offers, listing blockers by the total number of app installations blocked and the total number of apps blocked. The apps are sourced from Marketplace via the REST API and their descriptors are analyzed to figure out what's blocking them. We can do this for many of the blockers, but not all of them. For example, we can't determine just by looking at a descriptor whether a given app requires a relational data store. That's all I'll say about Habitat for now. I mainly just want to give you a glimpse of just how closely we're looking at module parity. It would be nice if sometime down the track we could share this data for self-service module analysis and collect collecting comments on blockers, taking suggestions for additional blockers that we might have missed in our model, and so on. I'm uh, not sure if that'll happen but uh, I think that'd be cool. If you'd like to hear about Connect and Forge module parity, in particular what's coming up next, I recommend you tune in to Adam Moore's talk, Forge Extensibility, Past, Present and, Fu and Future, at 12.20 Central European time. Uh, he'll be addressing this topic, among others. So perhaps you've heard all of this and you're still asking, oh, what, about, what about this or that consideration? There is a lot to think about, and we'd like to hear from you on the developer community or the public Forge project if there's something you reckon we might have missed. But here's a snapshot of a few questions that are top of mind for us. Just questions, mind you, no definite answers yet. We're still thinking these through. How do we helpfully communicate an app state to users and potential users? This is something we're thinking hard about and talking to app vendors about at the moment. Customers increasingly care about data egress, but they also care about features, and some apps will need to live in state two or state three for the foreseeable future in order to offer those core features. What data egress is occurring doesn't tell the whole story. The why and the who play into it as well. Does the data egress seem reasonable given what the app does? Perhaps the app could provide text to explain the egress and permissions it's asking for. Is the data going to a party that I trust? and that I'm satisfied I can comply with my security and privacy requirements. 
How can we advance the state of app security? Or more concretely, how can we put to bed some of the challenges we faced with Connect as we drive towards state two and beyond? Uh, one that comes to mind in particular, although there are others, is the challenge of expired or dangling domains. What security measures could we implement to prevent theft of data if an app's server domain is taken over? Another challenge is around act as user, the out of band impersonation scope. Being able to impersonate any user on the site at any time grants the app a lot of power. But there are times that it seems to be uh, the most viable way for certain apps to accomplish certain things, due, for example, to the highly configurable permission models of Jira and Confluence. So that's something we're thinking of. Next, how can we support data intensive apps? Certain apps need to do a lot of processing to deliver their advertised functionality. For example, an app that handles lots of web triggers in order to build some kind of aggregate view or report. It doesn't want to filter those because it wants to see all of them. If such an app moves onto Forge and adopts product triggers, it might start hitting up against invocation quotas that it didn't have to worry about before. We need to keep this in mind as we continue to review what our quotas are and how they're calculated and applied. What more might be needed to enable migrating data from Connect to Forge? Some Connect apps store a lot of data in their databases. Some store a lot of data in add-on properties. App developers may wish to migrate this data into Atlassian hosted storage. Now, will most app developers be content to implement their own means of migrating that data as installation sites move onto the Forge version, or will they want or need the platform to provide hooks and other affordances to help them do so? And speaking of moving installations, could installations be migrated without admin approval? Today, an installation always requires admin approval in order to be upgraded from Connect to Forge. Some apps have gone their whole lives without making any change that would require admin approval of an upgrade. So they all roll out automatically and relatively quickly. Given that Forge and Connect scopes differ and a scope change usually requires admin approval, is there some way we can still enable intervention-free migrations to Forge say, if the scopes uh, line up or agree in some sense. So most of those questions actually came from app developers such as yourselves, either directly and fully formed, or via a different question or remark that set us to thinking and led us to consider that question. Uh, so please keep communicating with us all, either your thoughts on the questions we've seen or your own questions as you mull over Connect to Forge migration. And that leads me, last of all, to wither, uh, a bonus, lesser used interrogative that simply means where to? What's your next step on the journey? Well, you might want to start here at go.alassian.com slash forge connect. This URL will take you to the connect to forge migration docs. Besides explaining how to try migrating one of your connect apps, the docs also cover how you can get in touch, follow the latest connect to forge news and discussions. And there are also links to specific issues you can follow to find out how work is progressing on a particular blocker that matters to you. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you leave this session intrigued, reassured, and keen to continue with us on the Connect to Forge journey.